We're just so excited to meet you again and do this dissection. I think this has been the most talked about session all day and all week. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Darren, because I know the students are going to be fascinated with that. And I will upload those documents to our, our resource page so the kids will have them as soon as possible. Okay, I can see. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I am connected at an extremely low speed. Uh, call speed. Um, as far as I know, I didn't change anything about how I dialed in. Um, so I don't know that I could um, do anything about it, but it is very, very low. I apologize for that. Um, the good news is the squid that I'm dissecting is not going to be moving. <laughs> so it should look pretty clear on the screen when we get to that point. Uh, so <clears throat> welcome to the Alaska Sea Life Center, everyone. My name is Darren. And thanks for joining us today, despite all the hardships that we're all enduring right now. Uh, we're finding really creative ways to remain social and try to remain connected to each other. And um, what I would like to do first is just kind of connect you to the Alaska Sea Life Center. And um, I'm in an unusual location right now. This is actually our touch pool here, so I can feel urchins and anemones. And uh, there's some sea cucumbers in here that I can sort of pet. Uh, and these animals, I'm sure, are terribly lonely right now without all of their humans coming by and, and uh, feeling them every day when we're open to the public. Uh, you may see a few folks walking by, but it's really just a handful of our staff who are here, the folks who take care of the animals and take care of the pumps and the building. Um, and then the education team is here. Part of, uh, part of our education team is here uh, doing these live programs uh, like the ones that we're doing right now. So. Uh, the Alaska Sea Life Center is a place where uh, folks can come from around the world to visit and learn about Alaska's ocean animals. And I want to show you a little video of some of the animals that we have. Uh, and then we're going to talk specifically about our octopus. Looks like my DVD player is still taking a moment to have a third cup of coffee for the day. We've really put this thing through the works today. Here we go. Uh, and so this video will show you some of the work that we do, some of the animals that we have here at the Sea Life Center, and then we're going to talk about octopus and squid and their relatives. Uh, looking outside right now, there's definitely not this much snow on the ground. There are little pockets of snow here and there and ice, uh, but it's for the most part has melted down here at sea level. We go about a uh, thousand feet up the mountains and it's pretty well snow covered still. All right, here in the Sea Life Center, we've got our seals and our stellar sea lions, largest sea lions in the world. And we have our diving seabirds. So we've got puffins, guillemots, murres, and auklets, uh, diving sea ducks. You get to watch those birds flying underwater. Uh, among all the fish and invertebrates here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, we have about 5,000 animals total. And most of them are fish and invertebrates. Uh, we have a small handful of octopus right now, um, and I don't have one right here next to me to show you, but I will uh, show you a little recorded video of some past octopuses that we've had uh, as we talk today. Mostly today we're focus focused on a squid dissection. There's the touch pool where I am. And uh, we do these squid dissections pretty frequently in person when we have school groups coming to visit us. A lot of them actually spend the night. They sleep on the floor next to the animals out there which is super fun, you might imagine, bedding down right next to all the creatures. Uh, we also have a wildlife rescue program where we rescue injured and stranded marine mammals from all over the state of Alaska. And if we can, we'll get those animals back out into the wild. Sometimes we have to just find them a permanent home at another zoo or aquarium. But we do what we can to take care of those guys. Uh, in addition to all of that, we have a team of scientists. And just before this program, I just wrapped up a program with one of our scientists who is downstairs in what we affectionately call the scat lab. Uh, she was cleaning stellar sea lion scat samples. Super fun. You can watch that on YouTube later on if you have access to YouTube. It's on our Education Corner playlist. Uh, Kara can walk you through the process of cleaning poop. Sounds fascinating, I know. Uh, there's one of our scientific divers. Um, and that uh, scientific diving is a specialized career. Um, requires a lot of extra additional certification training and proficiency uh, to be able to dive and do science while you're underwater because of course that is an environment where 
um, there's a high risk factor and you really have to be very, very proficient and experienced before you can comfortably take on tasks like performing scientific uh, studies while you're in that environment. So it's beyond just sort of scuba diving for fun. Uh, it's a, a type of uh, diving where it's potentially a lot more intense and the activities you might encounter will be far more interesting down there. All right, so the animals we're talking about today are called cephalopods, and I want to start our discussion with what does that word mean? So let's uh, define the word cephalopod. Give me a second here to write that out for you, and we'll talk about what that word means, cephalopod. All right, here we go. So the word cephalopod has two parts. Cephalo is an unusual root word. You don't see that very often. There is a, a disease out there called Japanese encephalitis. It's a mosquito-borne illness um, that can infect people, and it causes a swelling in your brain. Um, you might also hear of animals like uh, crustaceans that have something called a cephalothorax, and that is a part of their body where the head and uh, the sort of torso are one, one big object. So cephalo means head. And then pod is a little bit more common. Um, you may hear of a podiatrist, that's a foot doctor. A tripod is a little device to hold a camera, right, with three little feet down there. So pod means foot. And I'm curious, and maybe Mally or Katie can um, pass along for me, why do you all think we would call these animals headfoots? That's what their name means, literally means headfoot. Why would we call these animals headfoots? Question. Why would we call them headfoots? Because their head is connected to the foot, says Gibbler. Exactly, because the head is connected to the foot. So if I were a cephalopod, here's my head. Eye, nose, mouth, chin, ponytail, hair, here. Uh, my arms and legs would be right here. And then what part of my body am I missing? I'm missing my body, right? It would still be right below my head, just in the normal spot. Uh, but... <clears throat> Instead of having my arms and legs come out of my body, they would come out of my face. And uh, if we look at a real cephalopod, instead of my imaginary one there, we can see that uh, the octopus's body actually matches that drawing quite well. If we look deep inside my drawing, right there where my head is, that is the octopus's eye, right there, that little spot. And if I zoom back out, See, just below that eye, that's where their head is, just below that, there's this, what looks like a giant bag. That is the body, just like I drew. That's where all of their internal organs are going to be, and that's called the mantle. I'll go ahead and write that word down. I'm going to repeat that word a whole bunch today because it's important that after this program today, you recognize that when you see an octopus, this big thing here is not the head, it's not the nose. Uh, it is the body, and it's called the mantle on our cephalopod. So we've got the head and then the mantle, the body. I couldn't quite hear that. Sorry, Darren, that was me. I accidentally undeleted. It's Katie. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, and then from the front of the head, we actually have all of the arms coming out. So on an octopus, there are eight arms. And we don't call them legs because they typically do not stand up and walk around. They use those arms to pick things up, grab on, hold their food. Um, they pull themselves along the seafloor sometimes, but they don't tend to stand up and walk on them like we would. So they're called arms. And they're also not called tentacles. We'll talk about that difference shortly here when we compare the different types of cephalopods. So now we know a little bit about the basics of these animals and their biology. 
And <clears throat> I'm going to do a little classification. For those of you who are in the upper grade levels, you'll probably all already be somewhat familiar with this. If this is new to you, this is basically just a way of uh, classifying or organizing living things. And so the kingdom is a huge group of living things. This one's pretty easy. It's the animal kingdom. Animals have more than one cell to their bodies. They can move. They're mobile, uh, at least at some point in their lives. They cannot make their own food like plants could do, and they don't have cell walls. So that sets apart animals from things like bacteria and fungi and plants. So we're talking about the animal kingdom. Then below that, we have another level. This is still a really big group, and we're talking about a group of animals called the mollusks. So it's the mollusk phylum. That's a group of animals that are very soft-bodied. They have what's called bilateral symmetry. Bi means two, and lateral means side. So they have a left and a right side that look the same, just like us uh, smiling there. They are the same on the left and right side. That's what bilateral symmetry means. And they have a muscular foot. That's where that word pod comes in. They have a mantle. Remember, that's going to be the body. That's sort of a, like a big sheet. Or uh, in the case of the cephalopods, it's more like a tube of tissue, uh, muscular tissue typically, that kind of encloses the body of the animal. And then they have a little tube called a siphon which pumps water in or out or both uh, of the body. A lot of mollusks have a shell and then something called a radula. Not all of them have those things. But mollusks are things like clams, snails, slugs, oysters. These are not super smart animals, right? Most of them don't even really have a brain per se or uh, it's certainly not a very big one. But when you get down to the cephalopods, remember we're talking about the head foots. These animals do have a large brain, uh, the biggest brains in the invertebrate world compared to the size of their bodies. So uh, let's talk about some unique features of the cephalopods. And you can see down below on my sheet here that we're talking about animals like octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and nautilus. And you can see pictures of them. Um, we're going to focus mostly on octopus and squid today. I'm going to highlight the mantle of my squid. And here's the mantle of the octopus. And I would like you to tell me, what are some unique things about these animals? So just draw first on what you know about octopus and squid. What are some unique things about those animals? Something special about them that maybe sets them apart from other creatures. What do we got, Katie or Mally? Gibbler says the head and the mouth. Okay, what do they have inside their mouth? What kind of mouth part do they have? Do they have teeth or something different? Oh, Aaron says they have beaks. They have a beak. Very good. Excellent. It's a hard beak, kind of like a parrot might have. Uh, so they have a beak. That's unusual. Same oh. thing, yeah. Okay. What's something else that's unique or interesting about these animals? Uh, Charlie and AJ said tentacles. All right. I'm going to say they have arms slash tentacles. Uh, I mentioned that those two things are a little bit different. Some have one or the other, and some have both. And I'll outline that for you. What do they have on those arms or tentacles? Ooh. Uh, Aaron says ink. Gibbler says suction cups. They have ink. Yeah, so we've got suckers on the arms and tentacles. Suckers. And then they have ink, uh, which helps them to escape. So I'm going to show you a little video of an octopus. This is not one that's here in Alaska. This is a tropical species. Uh, and the uh, person who recorded this video is Roger Hanlon. He is a cephalopod researcher, a uh, really prominent biologist out there. So. Um, <clears throat> 
he captured this amazing footage. Now, if you watch, just watch the rock here for a moment. And now we see the octopus. Now the camera gets really close and you can see the octopus's eye. Let me back up just a hair here. You see the octopus's eye has gotten huge. So this octopus was hiding and didn't think it could be spotted. In fact, most animals would never have seen it there. It was so well camouflaged. But now it knows there's something that has found it and is coming much closer than it wants it to. So as you might imagine, the next thing that's going to happen is this octopus is going to ink. Boom. So there's this cloud of ink that comes out into the water. It's been released by the octopus. And the octopus begins to swim away. And if we go just a blink of an eye forward in the video, where the original cloud of ink was is still down in the lower left. But if you look all the way up at the top of the screen, there's the octopus. And this is literally a split second that the octopus just shot through the water. Does anybody know how the octopus moved so fast? How did it do that? I'm going to back up so we can watch it in real time in a second. This will be a good word. All right. How did it move so fast? Propulsion, Aaron said. Jet propulsion, exactly. So uh, back over to my document camera here. I'm going to write down jet propulsion because that's how these animals are able to move through the water. They squirt the water out through that little siphon, that little tube uh, in their body. And my pictures down below don't actually uh, show the siphon very well. The siphon here on the squid would be right there, just coming out of the forward end of the mantle right under their head. That would be the siphon. And then on the octopus, it is there. It's just really hard to see in this illustration. But coming out of the front of the mantle right here, we have this little tube right below the head. And that siphon can be pointed and moved around. And so when the water comes squirting out of that siphon, the animal jets the opposite direction. So uh, back to our video then. Let's watch that octopus. It's going to jet away very, very quickly. And at the same time, through that same siphon, it releases a little bit of ink, creating that black cloud so that hopefully in that split second it can disappear and get away, far enough away that the uh, predator that's trying to catch it uh, cannot. And in this case, of course, it's not a predator. It's a researcher who just wants to show the amazing abilities of these animals. The octopus settles down again now. And you notice this time the octopus has just tried to make itself look really big, including by changing the coloration around its eye to make the eye itself look many times larger than it actually is. So just trying to look like a giant scary creature uh, is the next line of defense here. And octopuses have the ability to change color, to mimic other objects and animals. Um, and they will often use that for camouflage, like we saw in the beginning. We're going back to the beginning now here. Uh, but they can also use that color changing and shape changing ability to uh, mimic things that may make them look like other animals. So they're not necessarily trying to hide. They may be trying to uh, pretend like they are something that they are not. So uh, I'm going to also add into our list that these animals can change shape and color. And those are some of the basic abilities of the cephalopods. Now they don't all have the same exact features of their bodies. So uh, if I zoom out just a little here, we can look at all four of these at the same time. Um, we're going to compare octopus and squid and cuttlefish and nautilus, the four main types of cephalopods. So uh, first we have the octopus. It has a very, very soft body. In fact, there's really nothing hard uh, in its body except for the beak and its eye lenses. And then there's some tiny little balancing structures inside of its head. Uh, called statoliths, they're basically teeny tiny rocks inside there. So really the largest hard part of the octopus's body is inside of its mouth, that's the beak. The rest of its body is completely soft. An octopus has eight arms. 
If we look at a squid then, it's a little bit different. The squid has a long kind of slender body typically, and uh, they have eight arms, much like an octopus. But in addition to those eight arms, they're going to have two tentacles. And you don't see the tentacles on this particular squid. Uh, but there's something else. Inside this long, slender mantle, there is a stiff uh, piece of the body called a pen. And it basically is an internal shell, a shell on the inside of this animal's body that's going to support that long, skinny shape so that they can jet through the water, shaped like an arrow, that is something the octopus does not have. It doesn't have any kind of shell to its body. So the squid has this shell on the inside called a pen. And then if we flip over to the cuttlefish, a cuttlefish is very similar to that squid. But instead of having a pen, it has something called a cuttle bone. And the cuttle bone is this right here. So. You may have seen one of these in a, a bird cage before. If people have pet birds, they'll often purchase cuddle bones from the pet store. And this is the internal shell of a cuttlefish. The bird can scrape its beak on there, get a little calcium from it. And uh, it's also uh, a good way to sharpen its beak. So this is the cuddle bone. So this is the internal shell. It's a shell. It's pretty hard. And it's on the inside of the cuttlefish's mantle. Now you can see this is a pretty thick object. It's not very heavy. It's really porous. There's a lot of holes inside here, so it doesn't weigh a whole lot. It's not quite like a clamshell, not that hard, but um, it is a big kind of heavy, clunky object. And it's inside the body of the cuttlefish. So that's one of the reasons why cuttlefish tend to have this kind of stout, sort of chunky body, where squid tend to be a lot slimmer. You're going to see the pen looks very different when we pull that out of our squid. Um, another difference between squid and cuttlefish is the shape of their pupil and their eye. You can see my squid here has a very round pupil, and the cuttlefish has this kind of squiggly W shape to its pupil. Uh, that black uh, squiggly line is actually the opening of the cuttlefish's eye. Other than that, they're very similar creatures. They have the eight arms, like the octopus, and then they both have two tentacles uh, inside. So. Uh, the tentacles on the squid here in my little model will come out from inside the arms and they're very, very long. So we're going to see the difference between those tentacles and the arms um, when I get my, my real squid out in a second here. But let's finish up with the Nautilus then. The Nautilus has a big heavy shell on the outside of its body. It has a very, very simple, very basic eye. and the nautilus can have up to 90 tentacles. So it's very different from the other cephalopods. So let me just recap and write down these details real quick before we uh, continue on to the squid dissection. So the octopus has eight arms. So does the squid, eight arms. The cuttlefish, eight arms. But the nautilus has just only tentacles. So the octopus has eight arms, no tentacles. Squid and cuttlefish have two tentacles in addition to their eight arms. And the nautilus can have up to 90 tentacles. Finally then, the octopus has no shell. The squid has something called a pen. The cuttlefish has this uh, shell called a cuttle bone. And the nautilus has an external shell, a shell on the outside of its body, which looks a lot like a snail shell. Um, on the inside of the cuttlefish's shell, it's very, very different. Uh, inside there. This is the shell of the cuttlefish. Here's what its body looks like. It kind of tucks inside there. But if we were to slice this in half, you would see all these little separate chambers inside there. This is called the chambered nautilus. And it uses that to be able to float up in the water and sink down. If it fills those little chambers with gas, it will float higher in the water. If it fills them with water, it will sink back down. And so it can separate those chambers and fill them with gas and water separately. 
And that's how the uh, Nautilus is able to swim, even with that big, heavy external shell. All right, now that I've got everything written down, I am finally ready to get my hands dirty and transition into the squid dissection. So give me just a moment to get out a squid here. And we're going to start to look at the inside of these bodies, or these animals' body as well. First, we'll examine a few of the external features. And I want to begin with just a kind of general lay of the land here on my squid. Uh, we'll talk about the mantle and the arms and tentacles. So uh, the mantle, again, is the body of the squid. It's this large part here. It has these two fins attached to it. And those fins are typically used for steering and then kind of slow movements, uh, minor adjustments in their movements. And uh, down here we've got the siphon. We'll come back to that. If we roll the squid on its side just a little bit, you'll see these huge eyes. And they fill pretty much the entire side of the head. Imagine if you had an eyeball the size of your head. That's what squid have. So that's a basic uh, outline of the squid's mantle, its body, and then its head. And then at the end of the head here, we have all those arms and tentacles. So let's go ahead and lay those arms and tentacles out and see what we can see. Uh, if I separate them out one at a time, I will see, Jared. hopefully, yes? Jared, just just um, because your bandwidth is moving, so two things, because your bandwidth is moving so slow, can you like maybe um, take a like move everything slower? Like, um, yes. Thank you for the reminder. I forgot yeah, that we were uh, on a very limited slow. connection somehow. Yeah, and um, so we actually did have a power outage before this happened that may have affected our internet speed somehow. Yeah, um, I'm not really aware. And then, can you just please reassure the students that this is it, it, he's actually not living? Oh, that is correct. Uh, indeed. These are the same squid that we feed to our animals. And so uh, we take some of the extras and use them for dissections. But we get them here at the Sea Life Center pre-frozen. And it's just the same kind of squid, actually, that restaurants use. In fact, we, we buy them. Sometimes we just buy them from the grocery store uh, frozen. So. Uh, this would be what you would cook for calamari. This is called a California market squid or just a market squid. Um, and uh, it, this is about as big as they get. You can see um, its mantle is about the length of my tweezers here, which is maybe 12 centimeters long on this particular uh, squid. Uh, and uh, it's got some very soft body parts, and I'll show you that as we uh, continue with the dissection here. But basically, you would eat the mantle and the, the arms and tentacles, those two parts of this squid. Uh, they fry them in hot oil for calamari. All right, so arms and tentacles, if we zoom in a bit here, then we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight shorter arms, and then these two very long tentacles. And if we stretch those out, you can see the tentacles are more than twice as long as the arms themselves. And if I zoom in, give me a moment to readjust that camera there. If we zoom in, we can see all down the inside of the arms, there are these little suckers down every arm, hundreds of them. But if we follow a tentacle out from next to the mouth, you notice that there are no suckers at all until we get all the way to the very tip of the tentacle right here. And this is a section called the club at the end of the tentacle. Let me see if I can flip it over. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they don't. There we go. So right here, you can see actually uh, some of the suckers on the tentacle. If I zoom way in, you can see them right there. And uh, you can see these kind of hard rings around those suckers on the tentacle. 
Those rings are actually, um, they contain little tiny hooks. So on the ends of the tentacles, these suckers here are often not just grabby um, sucker discs, but they, in addition to that, they also have little hooks all over them. And the reason for that is how these tentacles are used. So I'm going to show you in a series of photos what that looks like. <laughs> oh, what a on the host said, Deborah, he will be very respectful with the animal. Scientists know that that know the animals are used for science and teaching. <laughs> but I want him to stop it. Hey, Deborah, we can hear you. Absolutely. Can you please uh, turn your microphone off? Thank you. All right. Uh, so, in this series of photos, these are just taken a few milliseconds apart. So, in about a blink of an eye, um, this is what happens. You can see initially the squid on the left has its arms all folded up and the tentacles are hidden inside. And it has that shrimp out in front of it. It wants to catch the shrimp. So, in about a tenth of a second, the tentacles will shoot out from in between the arms and you notice that only the tips of those tentacles are touching the shrimp. And uh, that's where the suckers are on those tentacles. So these tentacles are used sort of like a fishing line. You cast your line out and then hook your fish at the end of your line. Uh, that's the idea there. The tips of those tentacles will catch that shrimp and then they're going to pull it in closer to the mouth. And now you notice the arms are all spread out to the sides. That's so the arms are ready to capture that shrimp when it gets close enough. So those tentacles are used for surprising prey from a distance. And the arms are used more like the net when you go out fishing. Once you get that fish close enough to the boat and you scoop it up in your net, it's all over, right? You've got it. Uh, up until that point, it's a little bit of a, of a gamble. You don't know if you'll actually land that fish. Well, um, so that's how it works with a squid that has arms and tentacles, and you can see those two things are very different. Now let's go back to the octopus that only has arms. And we're going to see how an octopus can capture a shrimp. Now the shrimp is capable of swimming very fast for a short distance. The octopus is aware of that and knows that it needs to get really close and have a special trick to be able to capture that shrimp. And what it does is it uses this stretchy web of skin that stretches between the arms of the octopus, and it opens up that web and traps the shrimp inside. If we look at the shrimp, I'm going to play it in slow motion so you can see. Underneath the skin of that web on the right side there, you're going to see the shrimp is still swimming around, but it cannot escape. So the octopus has just created this giant trap using its whole body uh, and the shrimp is stuck inside there and can't escape, eventually that octopus will sort of shrink down its web, let some of the water out, and the suckers will find that shrimp. And it knows, even if it's something like a crab that's maybe not moving, the octopus can tell the difference between a crab and, say, a rock, because not only do the suckers feel and grab, they also taste. Imagine if you tasted everything that you touched. Um, that would probably help you remember to wash your hands uh, and avoid this virus that we're all having to deal with right now. Um, if you tasted everything that you touched with all of your fingers, just how much, that would be like overload for our brains, touching everything around us or tasting everything around us. So octopuses taste through those suckers and they're able to tell where their food is. So once the octopus captures that uh, shrimp, it's going to move it up to its mouth and use that beak to bite into it. Then the octopus, with its very soft body, is going to head back home. The octopus is an animal that can squeeze its whole body into a den that has an opening just slightly bigger than its mouth, its beak. So we have octopuses here in Alaska that are as big as I am, basically, and they can squeeze through holes that are just a few inches wide, maybe eight centimeters wide, uh, because their beak fits through there and the rest of their body is so soft, they can squeeze into places that other animals can never get inside of. 
So the octopus, with a very, very soft body, needs to protect itself by hiding most of the time. So it's going to capture food and then take it back home so it can eat in the privacy of its own home. We're going to see that it's not really possible for these animals to swallow their food whole. They have to take little tiny bites of their food, and that's why it can take a very long time for an octopus to eat something like a shrimp or a crab. So it has to head home to do that to be uh, able to be safe. All right. So... Uh, on my squid here, let's take a look now at the beak and see how these animals eat their prey. So if I look deep down inside of the mouth, I'm going to hold the head right between the eyes, just kind of pinch it, and then I'll let all the arms and tentacles dangle to the sides, just like that. Then I'm going to zoom in, and I'll try to hold this as steady as I can since the picture is not great. There we go. If I zoom in there, I can see there's the, the beak, is that little black part in the center. But what I'm going to pull out right now is the muscle mass, it's called the buccal mass, that controls that beak. So I put my tweezers down underneath it and then kind of pinch and lift up and out. When I do that, I start to remove the entire esophagus, this long skinny tube, and you can see this is why these animals cannot swallow their food whole, typically, because their throat, their esophagus, is so tiny. If we pull that on out, you can see it's just like a little thread. It's that skinny. And so there's the esophagus. Now, if I go back to my buccal mass here, I can remove the beak. It comes out in two pieces. One piece has already kind of fallen out, so I just lift it up off of there. And then I'll remove the second half of the beak, just like that. Then right behind that is another little tiny organ. This is called the radula. And you can see how tiny that is compared to the tip of my tweezers there. I'm going to set that down and pick up a piece of the beak here. The beak has a top and a bottom. And so you can see right behind that beak would be that little tiny radula that's stuck to my finger. The radula is sort of like a scraping tongue-like organ. And this is how cephalopods take bites of their food, is using this tiny little radula. Now, under a microscope, we can see how that works because the radula is lined with hundreds of tiny little hooks. That's what it looks like under a microscope. And those hooks are used to just kind of grate the meat of the prey. They scrape out little tiny pieces of whatever kind of animal that octopus or squid, in this case, is eating. So that, that uh, radula is like a little tiny scraping tool. And you might recall that was one of the features of mollusks, uh, was that radula. And uh, so animals like snails have a radula. They use it for scraping algae off of rocks. Uh, but the unique thing about the uh, cephalopods is that beak. And here you can see the beak put back together. Get that in focus again. There are the two halves of the beak reassembled. You can see why it's called a beak. It looks just like a bird's beak, just like that. So right behind that beak would be that scraping radula, that tool that they use to take tiny bites of their prey. All right. Well, of course, when they swallow their food, it's going to head into their stomach, and their stomach is located inside the mantle, down in here. But in order to get there, when they swallow their food, because of this unusual body arrangement, body, then head, then arms, their esophagus, this little tiny tube over here, goes right through the center of their head, which actually goes through the middle of their brain. So when they swallow their food, it actually goes right through the center of their brain, which may be a reason for having such a tiny esophagus. You don't want to take giant bites if it's going to give you a headache every time, right? So they have this teeny esophagus that goes through the center of their brain and into the stomach. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look inside the mantle and see some of those internal organs. Before I do that, I've got my squid lying on its back 
And I can do that because, or I can know that because I see these darker spots on the top side, that's the back of the squid. And I flip it over to where the fins are just flat on the tray here. So my squid is lying kind of belly up. And now here's what I pointed out earlier, the siphon, this little tube. And you can see the tube here is actually quite short. That's the end of it right there. I can just put my tweezers right through it. And it just barely fits into the open end of the mantle, which is uh, where all the internal organs are. And so remember that siphon can kind of move around. They use it for jet propulsion. That's the opening of the siphon right there. And they can direct that all around. And it has a little kind of locking mechanism to be able to seal up against the edge of the mantle. So that's how they uh, use the jet propulsion by pumping water out of that siphon. Now to see what's inside the mantle, I'm gonna go ahead, lift up the edge of the mantle here and just slide my scissors inside and you'll see it's basically like cutting open a sock. It's just a tube, an open tube. And that's the inside of their body right there. So when the squid was intact, all it did was pull water in straight into the opening of its mantle and the gills are right here. So when they're breathing, they're pulling water in and bringing that water right over their gills as soon as it comes into their mantle. Uh, give me one moment. I've got a second squid here. I would love to be able to show you the difference between a male and a female. And oh, lo and behold, it's been a while, but I got lucky and got one male and one female squid today. So we get to see the difference between the two of them. Uh, give me just a moment. I'm going to put the other squid in here and we'll see that difference side by side. Okay. So there's a, a fair amount of guesswork trying to find uh, males and females when we saw these squid out and we got really lucky this time. Got one male and one female. So here we have on the bottom a female squid. I can tell that because we have these what are called nidamental glands. And those are the glands that produce the eggs. And you notice these two big giant white things right in the middle of the body are just completely absent here in the male. Um, he's got a little reddish organ there, and that's something different. But these two big white things are only in the females. And then up here, we can see these yellowish eggs, the kind of clear gelatinous things. And in the male, we just have this sort of milky white liquid portion of his body. So. Uh, the female is easily recognizable by these two large egg glands uh, right in the center of her body. I'm going to go ahead and remove those so that we can see uh, that other than that, the animal's bodies are fairly similar looking. Once we get rid of those, uh, the main difference is here with the eggs uh, in the female. So uh, that helps us see the difference between the male and the female. Now, something else that we notice, it's a little bit obscured in my female squid here. There's a lot of excess liquid inside there. Uh, but this kind of blackish silvery part almost looks like a tiny fish. Uh, but we know that the squid couldn't possibly have swallowed a fish that large. That is actually the ink sac. And I'll come back to it uh, in a few minutes after we've looked at a few other organs but I do want to examine a few things before I turn everything black with that ink. All right, here we have the gills again. As the squid opens its mantle, it pulls water in right over those gills. And at the inner end of each gill, there is a heart. So the squid actually has three separate hearts. And these are very difficult to see, but I'm going to do my best to point out where they are, at least, even if you can't really see them on screen. One of them is this little pale yellowish part right here. And I can see that because I follow the gill down to where it attaches, and then I see this separate yellow organ right there at the end of the gill. That's one heart for that gill. Then on the opposite side, we have a heart over here for this other gill. On the other side. Then there's a third heart right here in the center, this kind of darker yellow area that pumps the blood through the rest of the body. So that we have two branchial hearts, the gill hearts, and then we have the one systemic heart in the center for the rest of the body. On the female squid today, uh, her hearts are really not very easy to see, um, much worse. So I'm not going to bother with that one. We're just continuing to look at that male squid.
All right, before I look at the ink sac now, I want to show you the pen of our squid. Remember, that's the internal shell. That's the shell that supports the, the mantle, that long, skinny mantle, that body. And it runs all along the top end. That's the end of the pen right there, just above and behind the head. And so to, to pull that pen out, what I'm going to do is take the head and arms and just lift them up on top of the rest of the body. Set them down there. And I'm going to hold the mantle down while I grab the end of that pen. And you'll see it's just going to slide right on out of there. So the pen almost looks and feels like it's made of plastic. It's just this clear, uh, somewhat hard object. Down here where the, the pen is kind of pointy, it's a little bit more stiff. Um, but out here, it feels a little floppy, actually. And this is what supports that long, skinny shape of the mantle on the squid. And remember that compared to the cuddle bone from the cuttlefish that we saw earlier. So it's a vast difference between those two animals, the squid and the cuttlefish, uh, that little internal shell, that supporting mechanism that they have inside their mantle is very, very different. Okay, now that I've got a pen, I feel like I need some ink. So I'm gonna go back to my ink sack here and let's see if we can find some ink in there from my little male squid. It's got a pretty good looking ink sack. I'm gonna peel that away from the body so that I can move it over to a dry spot. Students want to know if you can actually write with that ink? I'm going to see if I can. Let's see if we can do it. So I need to break it open first. And you can see, now that I've got it uh, punctured, this ink sac is leaking ink. And it is very, very black now that I've got it opened up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pen and take the pointy end of it. and see if I can do a little writing. Oh, we're getting somewhere. You have any hockey fans out there? Of course we do, except, um, you know, there's no hockey right now. Yeah, there's no hockey. All right. Well, a little virtual support for Toronto. Uh, go Leafs. <clears throat> so, yes, indeed, you can write with this. Uh, in fact, uh, cephalopod ink was one of the original ingredients in India ink, which was the, the ink that you would use in a fountain pen. And... Uh, you can see the shape of that pen uh, it might not be super obvious, but it's actually it's kind of feather shaped. And so that's where it gets its name. It's kind of shaped like a quill uh, feather pen that they would have used, oh, 100 years ago or so. Um, we used to talk about how sailors could um, extract the pen and the ink, you know, and write in their journals. I have a feeling back in those days, Sailors weren't terribly literate, so it was probably more doodling than writing uh, poetry, uh, just as a guess. But, but yes, and there are still artists today, after they harvest a cephalopod, they can extract the ink and then use that for artwork. You can do paintings with it. Uh, it's a neat medium, and it, it, uh, because it's a very organic thing, comes from a living animal, the, the feel and the look of that ink is very different from something that's just you know, produced in a lab. Or extracted other ways. So, uh, yeah, indeed, you can write with it. I do have a couple other things I would love to show you. We've got a few more minutes. Can we continue on a little bit, Mally? Since we got a really late start. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I think the kids are. Um, they were fascinated a little bit. Um, some of them were maybe hadn't seen a dissection before, so it was. Oh. Uh, did, you, did you learn something from that? Class? 
Understandable. It's super cool. Dawson said super cool. Gabriel said yes. <laughs> I learned something. Nice. All right. Male and female together because normally. Um, yeah. I always care. just have really poor luck. <laughs> yeah. I, it's been uh, probably years since I've actually gotten just two uh, just right. Um, so what I'm going to do next is maybe a little bit more gruesome, but this is actually what we would do if we were preparing this for uh, to cook it, we would want to clean off the mantle. So I just kind of peeled all the other organs off of the mantle. And now it's a little bit easier to see uh, on the female, the uh, branchial hearts because the gills are left behind and those two little yellow hearts are just right there. Uh, the systemic heart is gone now, but you can see those gills. And what I want to show is on the other side here, how these animals change color. So you see these little spots everywhere, and there's all these red spots and black spots. Some are big, some are small. That's the key right there, is whether the spots are big or small. If I take my finger in this area where it's just kind of white, but if you look really closely, those, there's a bunch of little tiny spots. If I just start to rub in that area, you notice right away those spots are actually starting to look bigger. And what's going on is those spots with the color in them are very stretchy. And so when I rub like this, I'm actually stretching them open. And when the animal was alive, it had the ability using tiny muscle fibers to open and close those little spots. And that is how they change color. And because they're all being controlled at the same time, these animals can change color very, very fast. And this uh, is how squid and cuttlefish and octopus change the color of their skin is using these little things called chromatophores. Those are those little spots just by opening and closing. And it happens really fast, so fast that it looks like you're watching TV on these animals' backs. This is not sped up. They're just making these waves of color go across their bodies. Now, these are cuttlefish. And um, again, not here in Alaska. This is more Roger Hanlon video. Uh, this one is a cuttlefish feeding. Don't look away. Watch it. All right. That's a very abrupt change. So I'm going to play it in slow motion since we're on a, a weak connection. But you see it's got these waves of color going over its head and arms trying to kind of confuse the prey. And when it catches this fish, it captures a little flat fish. The tentacles shoot out so fast you can't even really see them. But then the cuttlefish now, while it's struggling to subdue and control this fish that's flopping all around, of course, the cuttlefish could be eaten by somebody else, right? So in an effort to prevent that, the cuttlefish now makes its own body look all spiky and it's got this really stark, angry looking pattern so that other animals would be less likely to try to eat the cuttlefish. And that all happened just in a split second. It captured that fish. Now the fish is still very much alive. The cuttlefish will hang on with all those arms and suckers uh, until it gets that uh, fish under control. Uh, and is able to eat it. But um, in the meantime, it needs to make sure that it doesn't get eaten by some other ocean predator that's out there. Uh, so these animals have this uh, incredible ability to change color. It's not only for feeding. It's also to communicate with other cephalopods. And so here we see some video of squid changing color. Now these are Caribbean reef squid. So here's a couple of males fighting. They're just kind of showing off their fancy patterns. Uh, and then after this one, we see a male on the left. And the one side of the male is very colorful. The other side of him is just stark white. The colorful side of the male is showing off to the other squid. She's a female. So on his one side, he's like, hey, baby, check me out. Look at how awesome I am. On the other side of his body, he's going, back off, guys. She's mine. He's trying to tell other males to stay away. That's more aggressive. But if you watch him, He's going to switch sides, and his body will switch sides also. So he swims over to the other side of the female, and now on his right side, he's saying, hey, check me out. And on his left side, he's saying, dudes, back off. Uh, so these animals also communicate using this color-changing ability. And in order to be able to do that, of course, they need to have very good eyesight. Now, 
uh, there's still quite a question out there, at least last time I heard, about whether or how these animals might uh, be able to see or perceive color. Um, but we do know they have excellent eyesight. And one of the parts of that is here inside the eye, which I'm going to open very carefully because it can be uh, under a lot of pressure inside there. There's a whole bunch of liquid that I don't want all over me. Um, when I do that, if I just kind of roll my fingers around, I'm going to find this little hard ball. And that is the eye lens of the squid. And so that lens is, you can see, it's almost like a complete circle. And that lens is what is going to allow them to focus a nice, clear image of what they're seeing. So it's a little different from our eye, where our eye is more of a flat shape. This one is spherical. And the way that they focus, instead of changing the shape of their eye lens like we do, is by moving that lens backwards and forwards inside their eye. So, uh, of course, there's one inside each eye, and that is just one more little piece that gives us a clue to how these amazing creatures are able to survive and, and thrive out there in the ocean. All right. I'm going to stop there, but let's see if we have any last questions that you would like me to tackle before we sign off here. Maybe one question or two, but I think the students okay. really, they, they all said they learned a lot um, on the chat, yes. like a lot. And this, they've really enjoyed the science lesson. They really love their science classes, as yours as well. How old, Charlie asked, how old do squid get, uh, some of them get? Um, most of these uh, squid like you're seeing here, these market squid are going to be maybe one year old, maybe a little bit older, and that's pretty typical. They're not very long-lived animals. Um, the giant Pacific octopus, like I showed you the picture and video of from here in Alaska, uh, they can live to be maybe five or six years old, which is quite a bit longer than most other cephalopods. Okay. Uh, but they are also the largest octopus species out there, can get up to be over uh, 50 kilograms, so huge. Huge. So 50, that's, that's a huge animal, huge animal. Yeah. And Aaron says, thank you so much. But students, I want to show you where I just put those um, resources on the website. I hope it works. So I'm just going to share with you because I love real time, like Google stuff. So um, here we go. So we're going to go to our, the Connected North at Home website. Darren, I don't know if you've seen this. So we list all of our I have not, no. Yeah, so we list all of our sessions. And tonight we have a Jedi Master who's going to be connecting um, at 8 o'clock Eastern. Wow. So you, yeah, he's really cool. So you can go to additional resources. And this is our brand new resource page. And oh, look up at the top. We have the Alaska Sea Life Center. And click on Alaska Sea Life Center resources. And go down, so all of the sessions that uh, Darren has done or will do with us, we have here, and Darren, I asked, I sent you an email about the other ones. If you go to dissection worksheet and click on that, it will take you to the cephalopods jet set worksheet that you just did with Darren, and you can fill it in. Okay, guys? So it is on the Connected North at Home website. And it is all set for you guys if you would like to do that, because I know that you might like to do that. Um, Charlie says you explained everything I needed to know, and you are awesome, Darren. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I aimed my camera out the window there so you could just see. It's a lovely sunny day, but it's really windy, uh, which is, I think, why we had the power outage earlier. <laughs> Something must have taken out a power line somewhere. Yeah, and maybe Hopefully we got back online with our generator. And maybe we'll get Tanisha to check your connection because it could be from our end too. But that was absolutely fabulous, Darren. And thank you so much, students. Um, a lot of you were very, you know, respectful and brave watching that. The first time I saw that, I my it's it's not easy and you did a great job. <laughs> and next time when you go out for dinner with your parents when we can, when we're allowed to go out for dinner again, 
or, or ordering from our favorite restaurant to support local business. You can order calamari and say to your parents, this, this is the outside of the, of the squid and this is the, you know, what part of it. Um, so you'll know a little bit more when you're eating calamari. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll be in touch soon, Molly, to uh, talk about future programs too. Future programs and resources. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Take care. Yes. Oh, yes. That too. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.